to our discussion today on when boldness matters in critical moments. My name is Mylon Thompson Bukovec, and I'm the Vice President for AWS Storage. I run Amazon S3, Elastic Block Storage, and Glacier Archive Storage. Today, we've pulled together some industry leaders who have made difficult decisions in those bold moments. And this topic of critical moments is top of mind for me because of the laser sharp focus we've placed on helping AWS customers navigate their own critical moments this year. In the middle of COVID and 2020, we have seen a lot of enterprises moving from talking about the cloud to building a real plan for migration. And that is a critical moment. In fact, it's been a year of critical moments globally, whether it's COVID-19, racial justice, or the US election process. That is also true for our AWS customers who continue to push ahead with reinventing their industries. As companies face critical moments, often the difference between success and failure comes down to how those at the top choose to meet these challenges and make the hard calls. Today, we have some industry leaders who are here to talk about their critical moments. I'd like to start off by introducing Shelly Arshambo. Shelly? Thank you very much, everyone. It's great to be here. I am a career technology executive, spent the first 15 years of my career at IBM where I was the youngest black executive named and then was the first black female sent on an overseas assignment, ended up running multi-billion dollar divisions and ultimately worked my way to Silicon Valley where I became one of the first black tech CEOs in Silicon Valley, uh, female, and built a company into a global market leader for governance, risk and compliance. I now serve on public boards, Nordstrom, Verizon, Roper Technologies, and Okta. I advise companies and universities, and I'm an author of Unapologetically Ambitious, Take Risks, Break Barriers, and Create Success on Your Own Terms. Welcome, Shelley. I'd like to introduce Julie Cordua. Julie, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and Thorn? Yeah, thank you for having me. I am the CEO of Thorn. Uh, we're an organization that builds technology with a mission to end online child sexual abuse. Uh, I started my career in wireless technology, uh, spent about a decade uh, at Motorola and another startup wireless company. And then about 14 years ago, I took a left turn um, and grabbed an opportunity to uh, helped start an organization called RED, which was about taking the talent of the private sector um, into social enterprise. And RED was focused on uh, building a brand to partner with companies like Apple, Gap, Motorola to raise money to buy AIDS medicine in Africa. After understanding the power of merging private sector talent uh, to change the world, uh, and after about raising $160 million in that initiative, went on uh, 10 years ago to help create Thorn, where I'm at today, which is about bringing the technical talent from the private sector to work on behalf of some of the world's most vulnerable children. Welcome. Casey, Casey Coleman, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hi, thank you. I'm Casey Coleman. I'm the Senior Vice President for Digital Transformation with Salesforce, where I support our global public sector customers and help government agencies and ministries around the world with transforming their mission through the use of our platform and modern technologies. I started my career as a software engineer with Lockheed Martin and uh, spent several years with a variety of tech startups. And then I uh, also made a left turn and moved into the public sector. I spent 12 years at the General Services Administration and uh, the last half of that as the CIO for the agency and led several big change initiatives, uh, government-wide and, and within the agency, including the creation of the FedRAMP uh, cybersecurity uh, cloud standard and the agency's first move to cloud platforms. Welcome, Casey. And then finally, Eva Chen, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. My name is Eva Chen. I am 
a Taiwanese. I educated in USA, and then、uh, my company is a public company in Tokyo Exchange. As far as I know,、uh, I am the only woman CEO in Tokyo Exchange. So,、uh, myself, that's a very strange position. <laughs> so, uh, um, I. Chen Micro is a cybersecurity company, and、uh, we have about 8,000 employees worldwide. And I usually, except for this year, I travel around the world every month. And I was、uh, now this、uh, pandemic world is actually starting to、uh, get me used to stay at home and be at home. And aside from all those, I. Uh, I get more time to spend with my two kids, which is、uh, very good. I think for a lot of women, career women like us,、uh, this is a precious time that we can spend more time with our families. Welcome, Eva. I'm so glad to have you and all of our speakers here to talk about how boldness matters in critical moments. So let's start with the first question. AWS, as you know, has worked closely with many startups, companies like Airbnb, Slack, Stripe, Twilio, Netflix. They've all started small with AWS and gone on to define their industries. We have a few co-founders in our chat today, so let's kick off the conversation with them. Eva and Julie, could you walk through a few critical moments? Were you led through change and made a difference to where your companies are today, Eva? Let's start with you. Wow, critical moment.、Uh, although my resume is very simple, I'm just co-founder and work on the same company, Trend Micro, for 30 years. And Trend Micro is also a very simple company that we work on cybersecurity for 30 years, never change. But there's a few critical moment, especially one that is the one in still remember the day, April twenty first, two thousand and five, when I just took on the CEO role, and、um, Trend Micro was a company that we do antivirus, so we publish the virus pattern file a lot every day, and on that day, one. Pattern file update crashed millions of computer worldwide, including in Japan, our home market. In Japan, those speedy train that never stopped was stopped because of that pattern file crash. Their computer and they delayed the the whole speedy train. So you can imagine how difficult that time was. That critical moment is where I、um, I feel is the turning point for me myself as a leader and also for Trend Micro. I flew into Japan and I need to do all those、uh, formal apologizing、uh, <laughs> gesture. But at that press、uh, conference, I decided to say. I apologize for the inconvenience we caused for everybody, but I won't apologize for why we do this. Because I know, as a cybersecurity company, taking the risk and make the decision at the point we need and doing the innovation we need is the key to our success, and that was why. At that time, we published that pattern file because our engineer was trying to stop、uh, we call multi-facing、um, encrypted, self-encrypted、uh, computer viruses, and we need to publish that type of、uh, more aggressive pattern file. And that was the moment because I know if I starting to say, "Oh, we will punish the the." People who wrote the the pattern file, I will kill the whole innovation spirit in Trend Micro, and I need to take that risk to tell the Japanese audience that we need to preserve that innovation. But maybe later on, I will say 
because of that decision was where we, Trend Micro, become the first one to publish our patent file from the cloud. We don't publish the patent file down to the desktop anymore since then because of that event. So I would say that's my critical moment, but that critical moment led Trend Micro to today, we become the cloud security leader. Certainly a bold moment, Eva, and a moment it sounds like where you had to take a step forward and then also do it with courage. Uh, Julie, do you have anything that you wanted to share about a critical moment that changed the early stages of Thorn? Uh, yeah, thanks, Milan. I, um, it's interesting. Sometimes you don't know what those critical moments are until you're past them and you look back and you understand how they were pivotal, pivotal in the direction of your organization. Um, so one of the things I, I think about is how Thorne became a product organization. So when Thorne was born 10 years ago, we stated very simply that our goal was to drive technology innovation to fight child sexual exploitation. And we actually said with our board and our founders and our small team at the time of four people, we weren't ever gonna be big. We really wanted to basically inject the idea into the ecosystem that technology needed to work on behalf of child sexual abuse victims. And we were going to um, prototype things. We were going to pressure tech companies to, to make different moves. We were going to work with law enforcement to um, come up with new technology ideas that they could use to, to help find victims faster. And in our first five years, we did that. We had a very small team and we outsourced a lot of our technology development and we prototyped things. But it was about uh, year four where we actually landed on with some tech partners, an algorithm that would help law enforcement identify child sex trafficking victims being sold online in the United States faster than they could without this. And we put it into market and we were testing it with law enforcement across the country and we realized it was working. And we thought, okay, well, this is a perfect example of why we exist. We're going to create this and hand it off to law enforcement to build into something for their systems that will help them. And as we went down that path, we realized really quickly that that was not going to serve the child the best. And at the end of the day, we existed to serve the children who needed technology to work for them. And so I remember going to our board and I said, I think we need to productize this and I think we need to own it. And I think we need to scale it so that it can be available to any law enforcement officer in the country who works on behalf of children every single day and that there won't be the limits put on it if it was just with one agency. And I remember all of the questions and, and um, from external advisors, from people internally, we're a nonprofit, we're not a tech company. Do you know what happens when you productize things? You gotta scale, you gotta raise a lot of money. Where are you gonna get all your cloud computing? How are you gonna do that so quickly? All these questions about all the reasons why we shouldn't productize this. And yet we did. Uh, we took a leap and we realized that unless we did that, what we had built that was saving children faster, identifying child victims faster, would never really see the light of day, would never see its full potential. And, and we really, in the face of kind of fear and potential failures people laid out for us, we made that decision. We were going to become a product organization. And that was very critical. We, I think at the time we were maybe seven employees maybe a few hundred thousand dollars in income for the organization. And we had a prototype. Today, we now have software at work in 55 countries, 10,000 law enforcement agencies have identified over 16,000 child victims. And it's like, you never, we never would have scaled to that type of impact if we hadn't made that choice at that point in time to think differently about what we were building and how it could, um, the potential we could reach. 
Yeah, that's a great perspective too, Julie. I think a lot of people come to reInvent because they want to learn about how other customers have navigated tough decisions or technology choices. And what you're talking about is, is certainly very true. I think sometimes those moments you don't know how important they're going to be, but making the right decision and the right choice in that moment ends up just having a, a pretty long-term effect. Shelly, do you have any other uh, perspective you'd like to share with us on, on how a bold moment shifted the course of, of a company that you have run? Absolutely. Uh, that would be metric stream. So you have to picture this. Here we are. Um, I was hired to be CEO of Metric Stream, but it was a very broken company and actually called Zaplet at the time. And it was a restart. The product they were selling, nobody was buying. Um, and the investors, most of them were convinced they were going to lose their money anyway. So I was really the last chance. Of, is there a company here or isn't there? So I joined the company and quickly stopped, you know, tried to reduce the spend. So we gave ourselves a little bit of runway went out to find a problem that we could solve, because that's the key. You have to find a problem that people are willing to pay for. And this was back in 2003 timeframe. And in finding out all that information, issues around risk and compliance seemed to be huge. So I said, great, we've got a problem. So we used the technology, we shifted it, created apps that we could solve compliance and risk issues for companies. The good news is it started to get some traction. We were evangelizing because there was nothing called risk and compliance. So we were calling it comprehensive risk and compliance. Here is software that will help you automate your risk management, your compliance management, enable you to understand whether or not you're a compliance or not. Because Sarbanes-Oxley was out, HIPAA was out, all these things that were creating huge fines um, and regulatory risks for these companies. But we were evangelizing, calling, dialing for dollars, trying to convince companies that this was a problem that we could solve. And we started getting our first sets of customers and we're finally getting going. And then here we are, first quarter of 2008, Gartner, the leading enterprise software company, analyst, comes out and says, lo and behold, there's a brand new market in software and it's called governance, risk and compliance and metric stream is a leader. Yes, right, all of this work and all of this effort, and finally, for the first time, our phones are starting to ring. And we're like, yes, so great. Strategy, we are going to invest in sales and marketing to really build on this momentum that we are seeing and we are feeling. We're gonna put more implementation people, and then we are going to ride this through 2008 and raise money in 2009 on that growth story. Perfect. And for the first six, seven months, it was. And then we all know what happened the financial crisis in 2008 and wham. I mean, door just, it felt like it just shut on us. Could not believe it. All this hard work, years of putting all these things together, evangelizing, finally had it. And now the rug was being pulled out from under us. Ah, we cut costs, we let go of people. It was painful, it was hard. And we limp into 2009 with not a lot of money. And now the question is, do we fold? All kinds of companies are folding. Or do we fight? But here's the deal. When it came to cash, we were going to raise money in 2009 on this growth trajectory that didn't manifest. So as a result, we didn't have a whole lot of money. As a matter of fact, I could not cover 100% of my expenses for the first quarter at current run rate sitting here in January. So are we going to fight or are we going to fold? talk about a bold decision. So did what I do, which is sit down and say, okay, what is it I want to happen? I want to fight because I believe that the problem we're solving is real. It finally got validated. And if anything, with the financial crisis, eventually people will realize that this is really important. So what has to be true? Which is the question I always ask. What has to be true? I said, all right, we have to figure out how we go win customers fast enough to stay just in front of our expenses because that's the only way we're gonna get money. Nobody's gonna, we can't raise money. So customers have to fund what we're doing. And then it's fine, how do we make that happen? Looked at the pipeline, looked at the leads. Is there a possibility? And the good news is we had a couple of large customers, one in particular, that was still interested in financial services. And it was like, well, if we can structure this deal so they pay us upfront at least half the value of the contract, when we close it, then that will help bridge us 
and we can get other clients going, et cetera. So it became talk about a long shot, talk about a must win deal. Are we going to do it or not? Talk to the team, create the framework, got everybody to buy in. And it meant we cut people signed up for reduced salaries. I cut, I didn't pay myself, right? Match me home and telling your husband when you're the only wage earner that guess what? We're going to fight it out. And that means no salary for, I know, a year. <laughs> um, so we did it. We did it. We agreed that we were all in. We said, never say die. We are going to fight. I had so many sleepless nights. I cannot tell you the number of times I went to bed, not knowing if I could make payroll by the end of the week. But we did. The team all came together. We made it work. Not only did we survive, but Metric Stream eventually became not only the leader from the analysts, but the market leader globally in governance, risk, and compliance. And it is still going strong today. But when it comes right down to it, those are hard decisions. And you carry, as the leader, the weight of the world. Because it's not just you, and not just whether or not you can pay your bills, but you have families counting on you. So you have to make sure that you are ready to step forward and really fight all the way through when you make the decision. Thank you for sharing that, Shelley. There's this common theme around courage, and what you pointed out is just tenacity. It's not just one bold decision, but it's continuing to step forward and make more and more decisions over time as the situation warrants it. That was a great example. Thank you. You know, critical moments in change happen in organizations of all sizes. And in fact, they can be sometimes more difficult to lead as the organization expands and gets large. In fact, in AWS, what we've found is that the biggest challenge to moving to the cloud isn't technical. AWS has more services and more features within those services to help any customer build any application. The biggest challenge for cloud computing is about people and culture. It's resistance to change, and it's fear of the unknown. Often, it comes down to how organizations lead through change. The big difference between organizations that talk about moving to the cloud and those that actually do it comes down to a few simple elements. Leadership, commitment, and organizational execution. Casey? You were the CIO of the General Services Administration in the US government and paved the way for 18,000 employees of the first US government agency to move to the cloud. Can you share a few examples of where you spotted a critical moment in culture change and how you took control of it? Yeah, and I've got to say that Shelley's comment about tenacity really resonated with me because the government, public sector in general, worldwide is not about bold decisions and rapid innovation and seismic shifts. It's about steadiness and risk aversion and carrying out a mission with um, with a lot of care because you're dealing with a you know, enormous responsibilities and taxpayer dollars and, and really huge consequences if you get it wrong. Uh, but there are moments when there are, there are shifts that occur and recognizing when the circumstances come together to create the opportunity to do something that, that has a big impact for the, for the better uh, is, I think, one of those skills we're talking about. And uh, one of those moments occurred in 2008 and shortly thereafter when the Obama administration um, took office and put together a management plan that included cloud first as a key technology and government priority. And that, that was huge. It shifted the default premise from on-premise software to cloud first as the first priority, not the last. And at the time, there wasn't even a definition of what cloud computing really was. There wasn't, a, no one knew how to buy it, no one knew how to secure it, no one knew how to operate it uh, in, in partnership with the cloud services provider. This was completely greenfield for the government. And so it, it gave the opportunity to do something that was, that was big. And then at the time, it looked like the right thing to do, but I don't think any of us knew how big it would be. And uh, so I had the opportunity to lead the committee of CIOs, government CIOs that defined the policies for all of that, for 
how you procure it within the regulations and the boundaries that the government has to operate within. Um, how do you secure it? We defined the cybersecurity program that became FedRAMP, which is the federal government's cloud security standard that's kind of become an international standard. We um, we defined how you operate it and what, what you need to look for when you're selecting cloud service providers and what responsibilities you, the government, need to be cognizant of in that partnership. And so in, in defining all these things, uh, it got really real when we made the decision to implement cloud platforms for GSA within the agency. So this was, uh, you know, first an external government-wide policy development initiative, and then we turned our attention to upgrading our old legacy systems that were uh, in need of either replatforming or uh, buying millions of dollars of new hardware and upgrading them internally. And Obviously, that latter decision was was not the right call at this point. But I had not anticipated how much how much anxiety and how much stress and how much pushback that decision would get. Uh, it seemed pretty clear to me that it was the right thing from a technology and and even a business perspective. But but just like you've said, Melon, it creates a lot of resistance. People worry that their skills that they've honed over 20 years of doing the same thing are not going to be relevant anymore. Um, they worry that their authority now is is diminished in some way. There's winners and losers. Maybe I'm not going to be the winner. So a couple of things I learned from that initiative, which which went really well and ultimately was a kind of a foundational moment for expansion and acceptance of cloud computing in the government. Uh, is that you've got to start with culture and you've got to understand what motivates people. Um, in any organization, there are people who are going to support the initiative. Uh, there's going to be people who feel it's a threat and they're opposed. And there are people who it just doesn't seem to affect them. So they're neutral. One of my mentors once said to think of any initiative as a campaign for election for office, which is kind of a timely analogy right now. And so he counseled me to think of it in terms of who supports this idea and what motivates them? Uh, who are those who are neutral and what might be in it for them to motivate them to be supportive? And then what is in the minds of those who are opposed that they oppose it for reasons that are rational to them? You, you've got to peel back those those reasons, get to the heart of their concerns and deal with them honestly. And and so we, tr we try to do all that, taking it in very methodical terms and, and working through the culture issues and uh, I, I learned a lot about that and I still carry those lessons with me today when I'm talking to other government agencies about understand culture, understand what motivates people and, and think, about, think about it from their point of view and find a way forward by making it a win-win solution for everyone. It's a great example, Casey, and a pretty big step forward for, for not just U.S. government, but for all kinds of global governments across the world that are looking for different examples of how do you use technology to be citizen first with government initiatives. So thanks for sharing that. You know, at the pace that technology moves, sometimes it can be hard to stop and react to the moment that calls for that bold decision. It's what we have heard right here from our speakers, where sometimes you just don't even know when the moment is upon you and it calls for that bold and courageous decision. So I want to turn back to the, to the speakers and ask, how do you know when, when a moment that you're in calls for a big or a bold decision? And maybe we'll, let's, uh, let's start off with um, Shelley. Do you want to have, uh, share some examples of just how do you know when you're even in the moment? So I, I actually have biases around this because you're absolutely right. When do you know you're in the moment? Many times you don't. Many times you don't even realize that the decision you're getting, that you're getting ready to make actually has bigger long-term consequences. So what really makes a decision bold is typically the level of risk that you're feeling at the time that you're taking it. So my biggest point is that's okay. Risk and reward, risk and opportunity are two sides of the same coin. So if you're getting ready and facing a bold decision, which means it has risk, that means it also has great opportunity. So there are several things that are important to keep in mind as you face that. The number one is speed. It's really speed of making a decision. And this is something I learned a long time ago in sales. 
early in my sales career, I had a new client and I really wanted to make a great impression. Had the meeting, found an opportunity, a need, a problem they had. I thought, great, we have a solution. And I spent time putting that together. In the first week, I probably had it 80% done. But I worked on it probably another seven or 10 days because I wanted it to be perfect. I wanted to make the right impression, the right first, right? So I kept working it, running by people, working it. Finally got back to the client, loved it, loved it. But he said his budget got cut about three days prior. So unfortunately, he couldn't move forward with it. What did I learn that time? I learned that 80% good and fast beats 100% perfect and slow. So that same approach is the one that I use when facing critical, bold decisions. It's realizing that time is of the essence because you're typically making a decision because there's a problem that you're facing, an opportunity that's in front of you. And the longer you take to make it, it doesn't make things any better. It's kind of like, you know, old meat, you know, the longer you let it sit there, the worse it's going to smell. It's the same thing. If you let problems or even opportunities linger, you will miss them. Compliance online. I'm at Metric Stream, and one of the team members came forward with a great idea. Let's create compliance online and aggregate a lot of information so that people who need to solve their issues with risk and compliance will have some place to come and we can see that they're there. Okay, we didn't have a lot of money at the time. So clients online was available to be purchased. It was expensive for us, but it was probably relatively cheap until others realized that that's a pretty strong URL. Well, we couldn't take a lot of time analyzing. Couldn't go do the budget analysis, what this was, you have to decide. Is this an opportunity? Are you gonna take this risk and make this decision? And we made it at the time and afterwards. I think, man, I hope we made the right decision. That was the right place to spend the money. It turned out it was. Compliance became our number one source of leads for a number of years for us. So time is really important in terms of speed. Second point I just wanna make is it's okay. A lot of times what slows us down from making those bold decisions is fear. It's fear of failure, fear of making a mistake. That's okay too. I tell the team all the time, if we aren't making mistakes, then we're not pushing ourselves hard enough. The key is to learn from them and move forward. You can always change your mind. You could always make course corrections, but much better to act with speed and make the best decision you can at the time and course correct as you go forward. Those are great points, Shelley. I think, um, you know, decisions like anything else, is, uh, it's a skill that can be learned. And if you don't practice it, how to make those fast, right decisions, and you don't practice it making it in the face of risk and, and potentially failure, then you're just never going to get better at it. So you got to seize the moment and, and, and practice and make them. Uh, Julie, what would you like to share around some ideas on when you know you're in the moment? Yeah, I, I think I, I'm just going to build upon what Shelly said because it was that was what I had down. I mean, there's a few characteristics. One is, for myself at least, um, there's always a sense of fear, and it is the fear of failure. So if I'm feeling that fear, I know that there is a big decision here to be had and getting really comfortable with that. Um, fear isn't a bad thing. It, you know, evolutionary uh, reasons why we have it is because it's a signal, right? That, that we should pay attention to, to where we're at. I also, one of the principles I work by uh, was just articulated, the belief in progress over perfection. So that you need to make those decisions there are very few decisions that anyone can make that can't be reversed and so, or that can't be augmented um, along the way. So movement is key. Also movement gives you a chance to learn um, because if you don't um, you know, move, you're not, you're not gonna get additional inputs to, make, to the decision you're making. Another signal that I often see is that you have people who have very strong opinions in different polar directions. If everyone is aligning in one direction, it's not a bold decision um, because everyone's supporting you. Everyone's like, yeah, that's what we should be doing. If you've got people who are really strong this way and really strong that way, your job, the reason why you're in that position or have the ability to be in that position is because you're gonna use what you know, what your vision is, what your mission is, the acumen you have about your business to make the call in that moment. And that's why you're in that position. I, I think about um, 
most recently, one of the areas that we've taken on is building systems for the private sector to detect and remove child sexual abuse material at scale. And when we started building this, there were so many people who said, well, companies already do that. Um, you know, Facebook and Google, they should be doing that. They're tech experts. And there were a lot of people who said, you can't do that. And oh, by the way, how are you going to pay for it? And when I said, well, we're going to charge for it. And they said, but you're a nonprofit. And I said, but we're building something of value that um, these companies should have. And we made a choice to invest um, millions in building out these systems to detect child sexual abuse material at scale, which is mission driven for us, but also it's working. So we now have software companies, some of the largest in the world who are using systems we're building and willing to pay for it with that money going right back into feeding the mission of the work that we do. And that was a tough decision. That was another point where we could have chosen to do that and gone in to talk to the big companies, big software companies and have them laugh us right out the door. So the key is actually taking the step and putting yourself in those positions to learn and move things forward. That's super interesting. Casey, do you have any thoughts that you wanna share on the topic? Yeah, I really like what the others have already said about um, movement. Uh, I think Julie said movement creates learning and and then you take that input and you keep going. It's just kind of the agile principle, you know, that we're all operating under these days. And I think you don't always know if it's a critical moment, a bold decision is called for, but you've got to just keep at it and not take no for an answer. Uh, one of the earliest projects I had in my government career was a, uh, an initiative to set up a customer service kind of one-stop shop for the government. Uh, it was a, a big project and I was found myself in charge early on in my, in my time in uh, GSA. And the team that was already there said to me, well, we've, we've asked Congress for $50 million and they said no, so we're not sure we're gonna be able to do this. And I thought, well, that can't be the final answer. That's just not, that's not acceptable. So I tried to put together what resources we did have. We had some existing assets, some programs that were already kind of doing parts of this work. Uh, we were able to put together a small amount of money to bring an architect in. We were able to launch a, a sort of a cobbled together first V1 version of this customer service help desk. And it was really rudimentary and really kind of more show than go, but it was something. And just that little bit of progress started to create a sense of momentum and started to create a sense of the art of the possible. And we got some good press from it. And all of a sudden it started to be something that people wanted to be associated with and involved in. And it became a thing that had resources because of the the sense that it was a thing that was succeeding. So you, you just got to be tenacious. And when you get no on this avenue, you've got to think about a different way to go about it. And I, I sometimes think of it as like water flowing, you know, water flows downhill, it flows over rocks, it flows around them, it goes, it, but it always goes downstream and it always goes downhill. And it starts with just a little trickle and eventually you get something like the Grand Canyon. So it, it takes time, but you've just got to keep at it. And it sounds like in that example too, Casey, there was this moment of, if not me, then who? If it wasn't yeah. you saying that's not acceptable, who would have done it? Right, exactly. That's a great example, thank you. Eva, do you have uh, anything you wanna share with us for spotting those critical moments? Yeah, I think, I think that moment for me is usually when I find something that I really believe in. And as a technology person, a lot of time is technology. The moment that I saw cloud computing actually was the moment that I just mentioned about the crisis happening in Micro. And when the engineers starting to, to draw out how we are going to put this virus pattern fire in somewhere we Back then, there's don't even have the name cloud. It's just a bunch of computer together that we don't need to put, put all this uh, uh, pattern fire security threat knowledge in this huge bunch of a computer linked together. I find that, wow, this is a breakthrough. 
in technology. And uh, I remember at first I starting to uh, talk about this cloud computing as like computer and database is like the invention of pen and paper where you can write. But cloud computing is almost like the printing technology, the invention of printing technology. You can vastly share your knowledge. And that is something that I truly believe in. And when you have this very strong belief that this is the right right direction to go, this is the right solution for the problem, then you can overcome. You, think you feel you're in the moment and you have the courage to carry on any tough decision. Talking about Cassie's example of overcoming or this government agency, a, the government's uh, um, resistance to cloud. Term Micros, uh, two of the biggest uh, market, Japan and Germany, those are two very conservative uh, uh, country, right? The whole country. And uh, we have a lot of business with the government sector in those countries. I remember the day when I need to go explain to all this government customer that how we are going to use the cloud and Instead of sending the, the file into their environment, we want to query something in the cloud. Wow, that was really difficult for them to accept. And um, the only way, just like uh, Cassie said, if they understand the threat, I find that the most convincing thing for them is when I start to share with them. That's how the bad actors, the attackers was doing. They were using this way, what in the computer term, they call it botnet. They're using the botnet to attack and they connect a lot of computer together to attack. And if the good guys, the defense, don't do this, then you cannot defense against the, or this new type of threats. And I think uh, that's the moment when you decide, when you have something that you really believe in, that was the right decision to solve a right problem, then you have the courage. And that's where I would always say, go back to yourself. If you strongly believe in something, then you will make that tough decision. Yeah, Eva, that's a great point. It's a very strong note of conviction that helps you navigate yes. that bold moment. In AWS, for us, it's customers. So over 90% of our roadmap comes from what customers say. And if I think about bold decisions, I'll just take Amazon S3 as an example. Amazon S3 launched on Pi Day in 2006. And there are more data lakes on S3 than anywhere else. And so the type of decision making that we have to make on S3 is where do you take S3 next? How do you evolve S3 for what you know, millions of customers want to do? And when you're thinking that through, the conviction that we have, it comes from what customers are asking us to do. So that, that absolutely sinks home with me as well. And you know, I, I think it will with a lot of the, the um, folks who are watching this today because we're certainly seeing a lot of critical moments play out all over the world for a lot of our different customers. If I just take the storage example as one lens to look through, we're seeing that with a lot of customers that um, previously had always been locked into these hardware refresh cycles, what's happening now is they're pivoting more to the cloud because of all of these critical moments. And they're seeing that what has been true has always been true, that legacy storage hardware is great at creating a data silo and locking you into refresh cycles. But when you want to be fast and you want to make decisions and you want to pivot because you have something happen like what's happened in 2020, you can't do that. And so you know, a critical moment that a lot of our customers are facing now, new and existing customers, is kicking off the conversation about moving you know, a particular application or just the whole company to the cloud. And that conversation, it's interesting, it tends to start with cost because it just makes sense to pay as you go. But then what they quickly learn is that it ends up being all about agility. And so 
you know, if, if you think about how a company's ability to very quickly develop and roll out new applications that responds to the needs of their ability helps bring things forward, it turns out that that agility is a game changer. And it all started from that bold decision that might have been triggered by cost. And so I wanted to you know, um, turn to each of the speakers and, and ask for you to share a couple examples, or a couple suggestions, I should say, for the people who are watching this today. The audience is, is they're all navigating their bold, tough decisions. They're taking something away from the experiences that you've shared. But if you had one or two concrete suggestions that you could give to the audience, about how they should navigate decisions like moving to the cloud or operating with courage or conviction or tenacity, as you've, as you've called out, what would they be? Eva, why don't you kick us off? I would say, um, actually, agility is what the, all the organization around the world need to have that capability. But agility, the, the basic problem about agility is not just technology that use not it is actually the organization itself need to be agil agility right so i usually use this example or the 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 words that i say um you need to have three elements first wise wise by data everybody need to look at the data and then you have subjective vision together empathy Second one is empathy for the customer that you're solving the problem for. You need to really have empathy. Our customer, for instance, cybersecurity, their job is not just to secure, is to enable the business to run. And therefore, you need to have that real empathy. They run, need to run their business rather than just give them very strict policy to follow. That's the empathy. And the third one is you need to have courage. Courage for everyone in the organization. Enable them to have the courage to make decision. Once they see the data, have empathy with the customer problem, then they can make their own decision. I think this type of culture mentality um, is very important before we can say agility in the organization. That's a great framework to think about. Thank you for sharing. Julie, do you have thoughts on suggestions that you would give to the audience? Uh, I think I'd focus on, on three things. The first, maybe macro going down to more specific. The first being, what are you trying to achieve? What's your what's your mission? And align everything there. And then ask yourself, you know, who are you serving? For us, every single decision we make at the end of the day, we are serving that child. And, and are we making technical development decisions, deployment decisions, cost decisions um, that are going to ensure that the best technology is at work in the hands of the most people in the world as quickly as possible to serve that child? and that guides everything. And, and the interim person we serve is either the law enforcement agency, the trust and safety official at a company or an NGO. We have to understand who are we serving in that spectrum and we guide all of our decisions on that. And then the third comes down to the individual. I think asking yourself, you know, how can you get comfortable with being uncomfortable? Um, I think when you have to make bold decisions, you have to recognize that it's always it's not always comfortable. Um, but the sooner that you can get comfortable with that, um, the I think quicker you can make decisions. Um, you'll build a habit of being able to move through these bold decisions um, at the right pace. Yeah, it's all about that practice. Thank you, Julie. Casey, did you have uh, some thoughts and suggestions you wanted to share as well? Yeah, I, uh, I love what Eva and Julie said, and I would just build on that and, and encourage anyone who's watching that you you have the opportunity to have an impact. You don't have to wait until you're in some kind of official capacity with a charter or a mandate to make a difference. Um, change doesn't oftentimes doesn't take a big team or a big formal 
authorization uh, time and time again I've seen it, uh, it here at Salesforce uh, like like AWS and your other companies were very customer focused and um, have seen our customers making amazing changes uh, just in, just since the COVID outbreak uh, governments that have launched contact tracing and um, new new systems for unemployment insurance and the ability to start to support people in quarantine and isolation. Very small teams of, of two or five or six or uh, very few people have, have rolled these things out in, in days or weeks. And so that's just one more, I think, inspiring example of the ability to make change where you are by, by taking a chance, getting outside your comfort zone, uh, thinking about things in an agile fashion, being willing to try things that you're not 100% sure are going to work, and then learning from that first V1 and moving forward. So think of yourself as a change agent, as a trailblazer, as someone who is a leader wherever you are, whatever role you're in. That's a great point, Casey. And I think the other thing that we talk about when we talk about um, agility, where we see our AWS customers really start to take benefit from the services and the platform we provide is about experiments. When we can set up an environment as we do with all these AWS services and you know a, a very economic model and pay as you go, then companies all and governments all over the world can have those small units try experiments. And experiments let you try something, fail fast, learn, and move on. And that key element of agility, once you start to get this flywheel going, where you have your, your, your agility feeding into you know, new ideas, feeding into more you know, openness towards experimentation, all of that creates this kind of flywheel of um, agility and innovation at the end of the day that, uh, that a lot of customers really can only achieve in, in, in a cloud type of environment. Uh, Shelly, can you share some ideas? I know you've learned a lot, not just from your metric stream experience, but also your time on sitting on, on the boards of uh, Verizon and Nordstrom. What guidance could you give to the audience around um, a few suggestions for how to navigate these moments? Yes, yeah, so first I agree with everything my fellow panelists have said. Let me focus on the speed piece because a bold decision is only good if it's made in time in time to truly get the full advantage of the decision that you're making. And the larger the organization you're in, sometimes speed is one of the biggest challenges in terms of getting speed to decision. So to drive that, it comes back to the culture point that Casey was making, which is you need to set a timeline for when you're gonna make a decision and make sure people know it. So if they have thoughts, input, et cetera, everybody's working towards the same objective of timeline of when we're gonna make the decision. It also brings clarity to people that are waiting for the decision, so that you're not causing people to delay unnecessarily. But secondly, and probably most importantly, is putting a framework in place of how you're gonna make the decision. What is the decision criteria to actually get to the ultimate bold decision? And communicating that and getting people on board and in agreement with what that is. That's how you can drive these big decisions all the way through. Because if you're making the big decisions, the bold decisions by yourself, and then just trying to sell them to everybody after you've already made it, that's significantly harder than if people feel that they are part of that overall process. So I learned this the hard way. My very first global job actually at IBM, all of a sudden I had people reporting to me all over the world and we had to really revamp how we were going to market. Well, came up with a, a plan of here's how we go do that and worked on selling it. But what it came down to was each region, right? Each region's a little different. And we have to make sure that people were actually thinking about the framework for decision-making the same. So it took me forever to get it done. We got it done, but it took forever. And after that, I always started with the framework. So create a framework for how you're gonna make the decision, what the criteria is, get input on that and buy-in. Then once the decision gets made, it's a whole lot easier to actually roll it out and roll it out quickly. That's a great example, Shelley. Uh, at Amazon, and this is across all parts of Amazon, we talk about what we call a working backward process. And the working backward process starts with the outcome, in this case, a decision. 
and it works backward from that, particularly a decision that needs to be made in a certain time, and it outlines, like you say, the framework that's necessary to make sure that the decision is made. Not that the decision is presented, but that the decision is made by that working backwards date. And once you do that, once you really kind of set up that, that you know, target, that outcome that you want on a certain date, and you apply, as you say, that framework, you know, first of all, I think you realize how much work is involved, right? But you know, it's all work you have to do anyway. You're just pushing it earlier in the process. You're getting that work done, and you're actually going to get the decision made faster because you addressed it earlier. And then working back into all the different stages to make that happen. It's a great example. Thank you. Well, I want to say a big thank you to Eva, Julie, Casey, and Shelley for sharing your experiences on critical moments. It was very interesting. I know I learned a lot. And I'm sure our reInvent audience appreciates hearing your perspective on so many different topics. I want to say best of luck. I am sure you're going to go forward and continue to shape your industries with your leadership and bold decisions. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. for having me.